it's going to seem that this talk is a downer for everyone, but it shouldn't be seen as, at that, as that. Uh, we are very committed now to doing research in hydrocephalus in particular to optimize shunt function. This is, this is my commitment and my team's commitment for the next 10 years. Um, I started in hydrocephalus research only about five years ago, uh, thanks to uh, uh, the Batterman Foundation that funded our work and many families. The issue is that before you start researching something like hydrocephalus, you have to lay the grounds, you have to lay the facts. What do we know? What do we not know? What do we think we know? And this is what this is about. This is based on a survey that we just published last month uh, in our main journal. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it, it struck a chord with the pediatric neurosurgeons. To, 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 uh, it was the, the uh, main paper in, a, in, in that issue with an editorial because everybody that, that does what I do deals with the same problems. And, and everybody understands the challenges so what I'm going to tell you today is not going to seem foreign to you because I know a lot of you have suffered as families with either kids or yourselves having hydrocephalus and, and shunt problems. So uh, this is hydrocephalus. Hydro from water, cephaly is head from Greek. And these are the various disorders that cause it. Uh, prematurity is one of the major causes, followed by spina bifida, hemorrhage, congenital lesions, Chiari malformations, and other. So there are a variety of different things that cause hydrocephalus. In adults, for example, if an aneurysm blows and you have uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, you can develop hydrocephalus from this. If you develop a brain tumor, you can develop hydrocephalus from this. It is half of what I do in, in my practice, and it's about 80 or 90 percent of the morbidity that, that we have in, in surgery. So in 1949, uh, this team of Nolson and Spitz came up with the VA shunt, ventricular atrial shunt, where they place a catheter in the ventricle and then the other end in the heart. They had lots of problems with this. And the problem was specifically because they overshunted. They, they just, they're, they're constantly overshunted. And what happened is when they would lay down uh, or when they're in different positions, then uh, blood from the heart would go backward into the brain. And that's not very good. And it clogged up these, these shunts. So neurosurgeons refused to put these shunts in because there was just no way to control them until 1958. So John Holter was, is this fellow in the picture, and he's the father of Casey down below. Casey had hydrocephalus. His neurosurgeon was Dr. Spitz. And so John Holter went to Dr. Spitz and says, what are you going to do for my son? And he said, well, I have nothing I can do. If we can figure out a way to uh, transmit the fluid from the brain down to the uh, whatever cavity it is and a, with a one-way valve and some control, then we're getting somewhere. In two weeks, he made the first valve. It is the valve that we still use today. There have been some modifications over time, None of the modifications in 60 years have improved the rate of malfunction that the Spitzholter valve has, has, uh, has uh, given. Now, it's important to know that before 1958, 9% of hydrocephalics survived to age 10, all of whom were developmentally delayed. And after 1958, 86% survived to age 16, and most of them had normal intellect. Okay. Unfortunately, Casey didn't benefit from this, because when they, start to, they put the shunt in, he had a hemorrhage, and, 
uh, I think he, he died soon after, you know, a couple of weeks, I think, or so, I don't remember the exact story, but the bottom line is that it was a parent that changed the field. It was not a surgeon, it was not a PhD, it was not a scientist, it was not a neurologist, it was a parent that changed the field. Now, not everybody is a machinist and can go into his garage, and he made it in his garage and do that kind of stuff. But everybody's an advocate, mm -hmm. and everybody uh, knows how, how to uh, push uh, scientists and surgeons to, to do research, to fund the research, to uh, promote it. Um, this was made out of silicone rubber. That was the first time ever that silicone rubber was implanted in the human body. Before then, it was only used on airplanes. So this is how big of a leap that valve was. Okay, now let me state the obvious. Shunts fail. Anybody disagree? <laughs> they fail a lot. Anybody disagree with this statement? We don't know why. There's high morbidity. Every time there's surgery, there's a risk of bleeding and infection and etc. There's headache misery, family fear and insecurity, and surgeon frustration. Not the most important one, <laughs> but an important one. Okay. So the purpose of this talk is to review what we recently found on the current understanding of pediatric neurosurgeons <coughs> and reevaluate where we are after 60 years of the first valve. And the question that I would ask, in the era of iPhones, Google cars, sending men to the moon, which is old news, is it reasonable to think that there is no device out there that can control the fluid output from the brain it's impossible that that technology doesn't exist. Mm. We just haven't applied it. Why have we not applied it? I think I can think of at least three reasons. One, the money is not in, the, in this. There are only a few of these operations a year compared to others. Uh, second, uh, neurosurgeons are very busy. And they're not scientists. They might observe something, they may not understand what they're observing. Uh, and third, uh, there's a lot of lobbying about who gets the money for what research. And we can talk about this at the end. So Mark uh, was a med student here. He took a year out of med school to work with us on, this, on these projects. And, uh, and he's now a first-year neurosurgery resident uh, in, in our program. So Mark sent a survey to all of the senior pediatric neurosurgeons in the country. It's an association called the American Society of Pediatric Neurosurgeons. It, has 200, it had 204 active members in 2014. It's more than that now. We sent one e-invitation and one follow-up invitation only. There were 64% respondents, uh, and we had 30 multiple choice questions. We designed it, it took us literally a few months to design it, so that it, never, it doesn't take anyone more than five minutes to answer it. So our first block of questions focused on shunt obstruction. And the question was, what is your primary valve preference? What do you use? And what we found is that the majority used a regular differential pressure valve. However, almost a third used a differential pressure valve with an anti-siphon device, such as a delta valve. And another third used programmable valves. Okay. Then we asked, what is the major reason for shunt obstruction? 
Is it the ventricular catheter? Is it the valve? Is it the distal catheter? And 98% answered the ventricular catheter. This is where most of the obstructions people felt were, were occurring. And in fact, that is actually true according to the literature. So in this very major clinical trial that John Kessel uh, ran, um, they found that about 40% of shunts fail within a year of placement, and about 50% fail within two years. The majority of these are related to obstructions, and the majority of the obstructions are in the ventricular catheter. So very much what the neurosurgeons thought they were saying. So using a free response questions, we then asked, what in your opinion causes this ventricular catheter to obstruct? Now this is where everybody was in different uh, places. So some said, well, there is inflammation that happens because of the foreign body, the catheters in the ventricle. Okay, and there is a paper from Seattle just a couple years ago that shows that uh, when they take out the debris that's in the catheter, there's inflammatory material in it. Okay? One thing I will point out though, if you put a, a catheter in for a reservoir without shunting it, we do it for cancer, we do it for prematurity, those never fail, or almost never fail, okay? The second is this catheter debris. The brain sheds some tissue that travels to the catheter and blocks it. The third, well, it's small ventricles. They collapse around the catheter, okay? The fourth is catheter position. And the fourth and the sixth are pretty much the same. Uh, in that they feel that if the catheter is placed next to the choroid plexus, which is the fluffy material that makes spinal fluid, that the choroid plexus wraps around the catheter and, and blocks it. Siphoning is one that's similar to the small ventricle one, but most importantly, this. So the vast majority of neurosurgeons that responded to the survey said, the number one cause of shunt obstruction is choroid plexus. Choroid plexus obstructs the catheter, okay? Now, if you just look at the literature and pick out only three papers, you will find that the rate of shunt obstruction related to choroid plexus is less than 10% of cases. That means the neurosurgeons have a wrong view of what those obstructions are. Okay, just because that's what you, you think you see doesn't mean that that's the, the, the cause. So, the second bank of questions focused on chronic CSF overdrainage. And there was a reason why we asked this question because this is where our research led us. Two, and, and that's the topic for the next lecture. But we asked the surgeons uh, to estimate the number of patients that's in their practice that suffer from chronic CSF overdrainage. So, is it 10% of your practice? Is it 15? Is it 30? Is it 80? The vast majority said less than 10% of my patients suffer from chronic CSF over drainage, and the median was 5%. So the vast majority of surgeons felt that chronic over drainage is not an issue in their patient population. So then we said, well, if you were to find over drainage, how would you treat it? And in this case, some used anti-siphon devices, some used valve setting changes on programmable valves, some replaced the valves, some added additional uh, valves or anti-siphon devices, some used abdominal binders, some used positioning. So there are a variety of different methods. There's no one standard agreed upon or proven method to prevent or, or treat the overdrainage. 
So then we said, well, if you were to use different valves for overdrainage, what valve do you use? And the ma vast majority will use the same differential pressure valve, but which also has an anti-siphon device in it, so such as a delta valve. However, still a quarter will use the same differential pressure valve they were using before, or the same uh, uh, OSV valve that they used before. And OSV is a flow regulated valve. And so the third bank of questions concerned chronic headaches. So we asked what is the most likely cause of chronic headaches in shunted patients? Half said it's medical reasons. Migraines, tension headaches, et cetera, et cetera, right? S second, stress. And a couple small areas there that says shunt over drainage or shunt under drainage. Vast majority, medical headaches. So if you look at the literature, you will find that headaches in patients with shunts occur in up to 45% of adolescents and young adults. If you look at the equivalent percent in the general population, it's about 4%, because about 18% suffer from migraines, but only about 20% of those have severe, debilitating, frequent headaches. So the assumption is that this is a medical headache, just like any other headache. But we don't see that in the general population. Even though headaches is the most common cause of visits to the doctor by the general population, it's not 50% of the population. I guess I take it back. 50% of the population will eventually have a headache at some point. But the severe debilitating ones are a small percent. Mm -hmm. So now for management of headaches, if you assume that your headaches are related to medical reasons, you're going to use medical means to treat them. And so 57% of the pediatric neurosurgeons that answered the survey said that they treat with reassurance and stress management. 28% send them to the pain clinic and a spattering after that. Okay. Now when any of you who've had children with headaches, you know, go to the neurosurgeon, the first thing on your mind is a shunt. I, I'm not gonna tell you that on their mind it wasn't the shunt too. These are caring physicians who want to do the best for their patients, but they feel that, you know, the shunt seems to be working, the child is not having neurological issues that are severe, I can only hurt them if I operate on them and I don't have a guarantee that the headache is going to get better. And they're probably right. So, okay. The, the final set of questions related, relates to slit ventricle syndrome. And let me define that for you. So, there are four ways to define slit ventricle syndrome, but there is one that is accepted across the board as the most common. So when you're shunted most of your life, your ventricles get really small. They collapse around the tube, and sometimes it obstructs the tube. So what happens is they lose compliance over time, and their ventricles don't dilate anymore. So all of a sudden you have a, a scan that looks normal or with tiny ventricles, bad symptoms, and the symptoms get worse and the patient vomits. And in some cases, the ventricles dilate ever so slightly to unplug the shunt and the symptoms go away. So you end up with a cyclical problem every day or every week or every month or every few months you have these bad headaches, you throw up, and then you're better. 
and that's called slit ventricle syndrome. And so we asked, how do you diagnose slit ventricle syndrome? And about half actually agreed that they diagnose it with intracranial pressure monitoring. So they put a pressure sensor uh, in the brain and they say, is the pressure elevated despite the fact that the ventricles have not changed? If so, then that's a shunt malfunction. That's probably a slit ventricle syndrome. You could also determine that the pressure is in the negative, which means that you're acutely overdraining and you have low pressure headaches. So it could, it could show both. Or it could show that the pressure is absolutely normal and maybe the headaches have nothing to do with intracranial pressure. So the second question was, um, what causes slit ventricle syndrome? And there, there was no agreement really. Some says CSF overdrainage, some abnormal compliance, but they don't know why. Some small skull, meaning something called cephalocranial disproportion. So if you shunt the child really early in life, the skull doesn't grow as well. The skull ends up being smaller than the brain needs. So, so you end up with, with headaches and slit ventricles. Uh, and early shunt placement is related to that. So when we asked the free, and the, the free questions where they can write anything they want, um, these are the statements that we got. I, I put a couple examples there. Chronic overdrainage of ventricles by the shunt, not enough resistance in the valve as baby ages and fontanel closes. Makes a lot of sense. A big number of them, though, has this answer. <laughs> Bad karma or yet to be understood factors during the developmental years create a non compliant or stiff brain. Okay. So then we said, well, what do you do with slit ventricle syndrome? How do you treat it? The vast majority will revise the shunt. Say the shunt must be obstructed, we'll revise it. Oftentimes it's the ventricular catheter, ventricular catheter. Uh, is changed, patient does better. Uh, some will do cranial expansion, some will, will add anti-siphon devices, uh, some might try to get rid of the shunt and do an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, and some will do lumbar shunts to supplement the ventricular shunt, and abdominal binders, believe it or not, is a, is a, form, if it, is a treatment uh, that works in some patients. Now, if we ask them to grade these, what do you do first, second, third, and fourth? This is what you see. First line, shunt revision. Second line, adding an anti-siphon device. Third line, doing an endoscopic third ventriculostomy, trying to get rid of the shunt. And if all else fails, expand the skull. And you can see here how this skull is bigger than it used to be. It's been expanded. So there are significant discrepancies among a group of very experienced senior pediatric neurosurgeons. The ASPN only has membership that is board certified and thus primarily pediatrics. Board certified, it means that they've been in practice for at least five years. So this is the senior community. Uh, and the majority of their work is pediatric. So they can't join the ASPN if they do half beads, half, half adults. So the discrepancies are that nobody agrees on what causes proximal shunt obstruction, which is the most common form of shunt obstruction. The second discrepancy is nobody knows what causes slit ventricle syndrome and how best to treat it. Okay? There is general agreement, but even there, you'll see interpretation problems. So everybody agrees most obstructions are proximal. This is what they see day after day. And that's supported in the literature. It's obvious when you look at most of the series, the vast majority of obstructions are in the ventricular catheter. They feel that the majority agree 
that the choroid plexus is the tissue responsible for most ventricular catheter obstructions, even though the literature says the exact opposite, which means that either people are too busy to read the literature, or the literature maybe, I don't know, is hidden, unclear. It, you know, we have enough on our plate. We can't read every article out there. Everybody agrees that overdrainage is uncommon. Okay? Everybody agrees that chronic headaches are most likely due to medical reasons. I will bet that if we ran a survey of families, <coughs> it will be the exact opposite. Yeah. Everybody's going to think it's the shunt. And we are planning a survey of families, by the way. <laughs> and everybody agrees that conservative treatment is best when you have shunt headaches without an obvious shunt obstruction. Okay? When I say everybody is, I mean the majority. One of the things that, uh, that I need to, uh, you know, I need to be fair to the community because everybody, you know, the, we have very committed uh, uh, neurosurgeons. Neurosurgeons for kids are extremely committed to the kids. They don't want to hurt them. Okay. They have seen situations where someone gets 30, 40, 50 surgeries and then is hurt at the end with no improvement and they don't want to be in that position. They don't want to put the patients in that position. It's not that they're refusing, it's not that they're being arrogant. It has nothing to do with this. They're, they're giving you the best judgment that, that they can give. Okay. So the limitations of the survey is, of course, we're distilling a very complex problem in, in a five-minute survey, and, and that has its own limitations. So despite 60 years of shunting, this is what we don't know. What we don't know is what valve to use, what causes shunt obstructions, what causes severe chronic headaches and nearly half of shunted patients, what causes slit ventricle syndrome, and what to do about it. What we do know is that hydrocephalus amounts to half of a pediatric neurosurgery practice. It saves more lives than arguably any other neurosurgical intervention that we do. It accounts for most of the complications, mortality, and readmissions that we have. I mean, imagine if each child is admitted 10 times in his lifetime, whether or not he has surgery, that's, that's a lot of readmissions. There aren't that many aneurysm patients or disc patients or et cetera that, that have that type of rate of admission. And accounts for, for significant long-term problems such as headaches and frequent malfunctions. Now I borrowed this from Paul Gross from the Hydrocephalus Association that the funding for hydrocephalus is $30 million. That's $3 per person affected by the disease. And 50% of that was spent on the MOMS trial, which is a trial for myelomeningoceles. Myelomeningoceles patients, spina bifida patients, a lot of them have hydrocephalus. Parkinson's disease on the other side, $629 million, $63 per person. Epilepsy, $559 million of $186 per person. Cystic fibrosis, $341 million or $10,443 per person. So only $10,440 more than, <laughs> I don't know how it mu multiplies, but. <coughs> With little advance in pathophysiology and no improvement in valve technology since Holter. So going back to stating the obvious, <laughs> here they are. <laughs> Hydrocephalus affects one in every 500 live births. It's the most prevalent birth defect. 700,000 children and adults in the US, more common than Down syndrome or deafness. It's the leading cause of brain surgery for children, 50%. 
180 different causes of the condition. Healthcare cost exceeds a billion dollars per year. And it's much less funded than research in much less prevalent diseases. So obviously a commitment to research and development has become essential. Thank you. I'll take questions. So are, are you reaching out on the political realm? I mean, that's part of how you get the funding. And if so, is there things that you would like us to help with? Angela, you want to answer this? <laughs> I, I would love to hear what you're going to say. <laughs> I'm personally not. Okay, I, I, you know, I, I do what I'm good at. Mm -hmm. I'm not good at lobbying. Mm -hmm. so but the Hydrocephalus Association and others are. This is why I asked Angela yeah, to... Yeah. The HA is really committed to this, and so they have, um, you know, they've expanded into, now they're in D.C. and uh, working a lot with trying to get big money coming up for research. And, you know, it's going to be for the government, NIH, and... NIH and upping so it's not three dollars per person and so they have and I, I don't know exactly where we're at right now but it's a wonderful organization to partner with um, by far the biggest the largest organization too that's doing supporting research with hydrocephalus and uh, they also have a connection with the hydrocephalus clinical research network which is a group of physicians that are working together to better you know to um, collaborate together during the research <coughs> So I would love to get on your list of people to talk to about. I, I'm very politically active, you know, and I've done fundraising for politics. I, this would be a better place to spend my time and effort. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be very interested in being involved in whatever way we can do. Yeah. Um, so I'm a member of the HA. I'm not on staff with them, but I have you know, de definitely lots of connections with okay. the organization, and we can talk about that. Yeah. That would be great. It's been neat because Joseph is 15, our son, and we went to our first HA conference when he was a year old. And that was back when, like, family was on the board. Not our family, but, you know, it was like a very, it was kind of like a mom and pop kind of an organization. And now they are so first class and just really professional and doing big stuff on the scene. Mm -hmm. And advancements are, are going to happen. And a lot of the research that is going on, the HA is funding. So, yeah, that's good. They have their own walks too, as I was hearing Kathy talk about the walks. The HA does a lot of walks. They don't have a walk in Wisconsin right now. I was chairing it for a couple of years, but my life has deemed that I am not able to have the time to do that. As you know, it's a huge commitment. And so, but anyway, yeah, I'd love to talk with you. I don't want to be the only one asking questions, but when you say <laughs> that it costs more than a billion a year, you're talking about the actual medical cost, not the outlying cost, things like educational cost and prison right. cost and the other things that may be associated outside of the medical, right? Correct, yeah. Okay. As far as I know, yeah. Okay. You said at the beginning that there's less of failure and shunting of like people with cancer or premature things. Why is there less failure? Why is the failure percentage less in those like categories than in say this category? Because that changes about every two years they come up with a new device that goes in yeah, sure. almost I had probably I'm on my sixth one in twenty years. Okay. But I also use, they've also used blood thinners to help some of the obstruction that happens around it. But I know when they take it out, yeah, the, you've got the growth the around it. Yeah, it's right here. I, I don't think one uh, cause is worse than another necessarily, yeah. except maybe for premature infants because they end up being so tiny when you shunt them. Yeah. Uh, the rest of it, uh, what I can tell you is that the older you shunt a patient, the better the outcome because you you don't have skull growth and brain growth in the equation. And then how do you expand the skull? Like, that you showed in the picture? Because I know that once everything 
you grow up and things close, how do you expand that then without causing yeah. too much expansion? It's actually a relatively simple procedure, believe it or not, uh, because, you know, we open the skull for a lot of indications, right? For a brain tumor, for something, uh, for cysts, for hemorrhage, you know, every, if you have a subdural hematoma, you have a car accident. So all it would be, a cranial expansion, is you open the skull in a bigger manner, and then you, you either space it out a little bit, reposition it in a different way, or sometimes what you can do is take out the in inside of the skull and, and make the cavity bigger. So it's actually a relatively straightforward, uh, straightforward procedure. Yeah. Why isn't that done more often than cutting bone away when you have your carry decompression? Uh, so uh, that's a completely different uh, topic. So the Chiari decompression is really a skull expansion, but right here where the Chiari is. Oh. It wouldn't benefit from a skull expansion there. Oh, okay. Yeah. What's the percentage that it happens in adults? What, what the, happens? The IH in adults. Uh, you mean what's the f incidence of? Yeah. Well, you talked a lot about how many children are born with it. Yeah. How often does it happen in adults? That they develop hydrocephalus? Right. Uh, I don't know the, the numbers. It depends on what's causing it. It's way less frequent than children, though. Yeah. And it's always downstream of some other. Right. It's usually caused by something right. else, right? You know, occasionally we've seen adults who've had congenital hydrocephalus that was undiagnosed for 30 or 40 years. Every once in a while we see those. Um, and you wonder why they survived for the 40 years, but, but sometimes you see that. You see that a lot too now with the soldiers, with traumatic brain injuries, and right. you know, that's, there's a higher, or um, an increasing rate of hydrocephalus in TBI patients. Mm. So, but the lesson, the takeaway lesson here for me, <coughs> being just an average citizen who's <coughs> aware and supporting of these people around me, not directly affected, is the lack of awareness, lack of education, lack of information, what it has led the last 50 years of lobbying by the politicians, Big Pharma, and everybody else that said, oh, these, this is the important stuff. Right. Exactly. In the balance of life, it may not be true. <laughs> but, so, yeah, so we have a crusade on our hands. Anything that's rare gets shoved to the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. hydrocephalus isn't rare. Well, I know. I know. I know. But, no, no, I, I don't. Don't know. but, but in theory, like, what I have isn't rare either. Sure. It just isn't known. But hydrocephalus is one there. in a thousand. For, for it's example, not rare. If, no, Jer it's, if Jerry Lewis is very common. Yeah, if Jerry Lewis's kids hadn't had muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. if they had had hydrocephalus, exactly. this conversation yeah. would be completely different. And, yeah, yeah, I didn't mean rare that way. No, no, I just mean no, no, no. rare as in public yeah. knowledge. It's yeah. not something. Well, I think a, a lack really of know. awareness. That's yes, and a lack, lack of support. But as far as the commonality of a condition, hydrocephalus is ridiculously common, and that's what makes this so obscene. To be honest, <laughs> that there isn't, you know, that there isn't more out there. And I, I think when Benny chair, he was the honorary chair for one of our walks, and I loved when he said, "Status quo is not good enough." You know, and that's why these kinds of things are so important because, you know, one of us standing alone, we're very weak, but standing together, we can be mighty and create change and create awareness and also create enough noise to say, this, this can't keep going like this. Oh, and this just reinforces my personal mission. You know, I, I came into this literally through the back door. Yeah. Again, because I'm not directly affected by it, but I'm appalled. Mm -hmm. At, at this imbalance yeah. in society for for what's for something now to look at those statistics I, I think I almost broke out in tears mm -hmm. and so you know it's just an average Joe out there with others average Joes who are not affected I'm gonna go you know shake some trees mm -hmm. that's, that's my mission has anybody especially listening just to you alone and some of the other people and I am also an outsider of you know this has anybody written a book about their experience that I mean sometimes it is something like that because you can talk about it and you can talk about you know 
people that don't understand, but when you're talking about this is my child and this is what we've had to go through, yeah. that hits home to people. They understand that. I mean, I think that would be... Unfortunately, often it takes people dying from things like that to make... Yeah. That's why breast cancer gets so much money and so much funding because it's killed so many people. And so many families have been affected by it. And because of that, they get people to walks and there's power in numbers. I mean, that's why, you know, I'm coming to the walk in Madison as well. It's not my walk, it's Bridget's. Because there is power in numbers and the more oh, yeah. we get, and if you can keep increasing those numbers, that's gonna bring more money to research and funding and lectures. <coughs> I, I just want to pause the, the president of our foundation, and we're at a small foundation also, wrote a book on it and her experience she donated all the proceeds to the foundation to help but I mean people reading it that didn't know I I had my mother-in-law who was from Chile I told her what I had and she's like my friend has that and she wrote a book about it and she knew exactly what sometimes I don't know do you know like the Sunday G come and walk 10 years ago only had 150 people show up to it or it was like 12 years ago and now they have like 200,000 people. Imagine the amount of money that's coming from that. So it's not just about books, but it's also getting people to come to watch. Well, that's what I mean. The book yeah, is what lectures. gets people to understand. I'm, I'm just, just, this is just a suggestion that so people if, would if I can add know the personal here. part so of it. So nobody is going to deny the fact that there's a lot of suffering and a lot of families that, that are in pain. and. And you know, you can, you know, there are people suffering in Africa, there are people suffering in the White House, there are people <laughs> suffering. So the, the issue is that, you know, nothing is fair around us, right? So, so I think a positive attitude is now we recognize that there is a problem that has not been addressed in 50 years and it's time to address it. So mm -hmm. the effort that you guys are putting in, whether through CSF or the HA, is is uh, needs to be uh, uh, enhanced. Yeah, and if you go to hydrosos.org, and if you want to link up with anything that's, I mean, it's they're doing some really great stuff. And I don't know where they're at with this big initiative that they were going to do for PR for it, but it was kind of off of the idea of the cold water challenge. But they were going to go a, a different a different way, obviously. Although what's so funny about that is that would have been so perfect for hydrocephalus. Water on the, you know, cold water on your head. Anyway, but they have an initiative that I I had seen a, a proof of it, and I think it's going to be coming out. I don't know where they're at with it, but it would be neat for you guys to be able to get on board with them too, you know, and because yeah. they're doing a lot of positive movement. Right, because it, it says I, for me in the education side of this is it's not just, it's the information, it's the insight, it's the think, critical thinking mm -hmm. that comes with this information. I've already and decided so he's going to become a, the scientist and develop and the, develop. The, <laughs> and, and, what, and what you just recited is, while it might not be directly applicable to some of the things that I want to have be advocate for, like Kiari specifically, the processes and the insights that they are using mm -hmm. are directly transferable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so we just research. have to make the creative effort to make And there that is kind of research first. going on, but research takes money. Right. You know, and so it's not just, you can do it. You know, <laughs> it's show me. Well, yeah, and in the, in the mm -hmm. what, five years that I've become more and more aware of this, you know, um, Dr. Greenfield, Dr. Eskander, you know, a couple of the, and, and the one in Europe, and I can't remember his name. Anyway, it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that there are only a few professionals who, how should we say, are passionate about it. And that's another factor that needs to change. Well, I, and I'm not I, sure, I'm I not don't sure necessarily agree with this. Yeah, I think you will find a lot of passion in most pediatric surgeons who take care of these kids. Well, the problem is that we are trained in a certain way, meaning we right, are trained to education. do surgery, to do to, to to take care of patients, to see patients in clinic, we're not trained to lobby, we're not trained to do research, we're not trained no. to administer, and that's and that's the issue. And if if we need to go into that, then we have to cut down on the stuff that we trained for to do this other stuff. But but the same, yeah. where I was going is, I think, other than 
you taking yourself as an example where you, you pulled yourself up out of the muck of the education and the stand, status quo process and said, yeah. hey, wait, there's, there's got to be a better right. way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't expect everybody to do that. But I do expect that over the next 40 years that the educational part that led you to where you are today will right. change. Yeah. And uh, that they will, they will have the confidence in their information they have to question yeah. some things that they aren't able to question now. So I, I will tell you that what some of us are doing in hydrocephalus or the Chiari malformation things, some of my colleagues are doing for brain tumors, others are doing for uh, brain trauma, so there are lots of passionate people who feel that the status quo is unacceptable and are moving it forward. Mm -hmm. Not everybody needs to work on hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. right. But I think, you, uh, going back to what I was saying, is I think that across that spectrum yeah. you just outlined, that that's the, that's the kind of awareness for the general population that needs to occur. Yeah. There is a general area that needs more attention. Oh, by the way, it happens to include hydrocephalus and all right. these other things. Yeah, nice. yeah. I got a quick question for the researcher, and I apologize, I've missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Joyce. Joyce, are there things that you could use help with? Because from my perspective, a lot of us, I mean, we're we all are tied up with whatever in our own lives, but there may be things that we can do to lend a hand, or you know, is there processing of data? Is there? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. It's just, you should never refuse. <laughs> yeah. I used to make that mistake. <laughs> bring me bring me twice a week. <laughs> say, what can you do is, a, is the, the okay. answer. And, and then she'll tell you and you say, well, we have this, you can help mm -hmm. with. <laughs> Does there a correlation with this in Chiari? Because I've in some groups that I found, you know, a few people, there are a lot of people that have carry that also have hydrocephalus. Sorry, hydrocephalus. Is there some kind of correlation between the two that some people do yeah. have? Yeah. So they're both what we call hydrodynamic disorders, which okay. means a blockage of flow somewhere. Hydrocephalus happens to be up on top, and Chiari happens to be in the back. One can cause the other. Chiari can cause hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus can cause a Chiari. And so they, they interrelate. And this is why CSF is interested in, in hydrocephalus in addition to, you know, what's in its name, C and S. So, so yes, absolutely, they're related. But until we understand what the physiology of the brain is, we, we just, we're not going to understand any one of them individually. There's a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I gotta repaint the side of my arm. <laughs> with a oh, with a message. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when people get headaches from this, is it typically like right up here? Is that where? Because like you know the Chiari. It's usually very variable. It is. That there is no rule for it. I Everybody's know, different. I have some people who have the Chiari, but also have had to have shots whether it be for the Chiari over this, and they said, well, I understand, both my one friend, she gets the headaches both up here and back here by the mm -hmm. shunt, and by the area of the Chiari, and some that she knows, they just get it by the shunt, or up here in front, almost like a tension headache, but it won't be a tension headache, it's because of the shunt. Can it come and go, like when you have the shunt, like versus like if you don't have the shunt, can it come and go? Because I don't, I don't. Yeah, think it can it come happens. and go. Yes, yes. If it were not this confusing and unpredictable, it would be very easy to diagnose these things. <laughs> Nobody would disagree with me. <laughs> it actually made me wonder if I have it because I do actually get like these headaches that feels like there's fluid up here, but it comes and it goes, and it usually happens when I lay down. Yeah, I, I doubt that, but. But yeah. uh, there's something to bring up with your neurosurgeon. Oh, you can't do that. He's been off the board. <laughs> Coley White, got, I don't know if you know who Coley White was, but mm -hmm. yeah, he was pretty badly prosecuted in Milwaukee for a bunch of malpractice stuff. I wouldn't go to him then. <laughs> <laughs> go to him in prison. I know you have right? comments. <laughs> I think your little sister probably does. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Got her. So good,